Hi, I'm James Suckling. Uh, probably most of you know me as a masterclass instructor, but I'm also a wine critic. That's my day job. And uh, last year I tasted 22,000 wines with my team, and I've tasted more than 200,000 wines in my career. But uh, I hope that those uh, ratings uh, don't go to waste and that they help uh, all of you and everyone out there to drink great wine. So I'm excited for this uh, quick uh, office hour session to answer any questions uh, you may have. I'm coming to you live from San Francisco. This is just ahead of my event called uh, Great Wines of Italy, which is a tour with 98 wine producers. Uh, they're all here pouring two wines each. And I'm excited too because I know there's going to be a lot of master class students there. I just did the same show in Beverly Hills and I spoke to about 120 uh, students and it was great to talk to them and I really enjoyed their enthusiasm for wine and I really really appreciated that uh, they uh, felt like uh, they had been enthused by the class and they were really loving uh, tasting the wines and felt like they had the upper hand on this sometimes um, difficult subject of appreciating wine but it shouldn't be difficult you should really like relax taste wine and enjoy it so I'm going to take a few questions from um, students and let's get started. Okay. Uh, so Carvin asks, as a beginner, it's very difficult to identify the subtleties between wines. Do you have any tips on how to initially train your palate at the beginning? Well, just so you feel better, um, I sometimes find it difficult finding the differences uh, between subtleties of wine, but it's really a matter of concentration. And I also think that when you're tasting wine, in the beginning, it's a good habit to um, jot down some notes. It makes you focus on the wine. And of course, you have to have the basics in terms of how to taste wine. You have to you know, look at the color, um, take a moment and smell the wine, then taste it and figure out the structure on your palate and some of the flavors. And finally, the, finish, the finishes, the, the way the wine lingers on your palate. But all this is about paying attention to the wine and also uh, having a good memory, memory about the wine. And this is exactly the process I go through every day when I'm tasting wines. Thanks. Uh, Lewis asks, if you have a weak sense of smell and struggle with identifying specific flavors, can you still develop your palate enough to appreciate wine? That's a really good question. I think that uh, you don't have to get too worried uh, about coming up with the correct descriptors for flavors or sensations from wines. A lot of wine uh, critiquing or evaluation is based on texture and how the, ma uh, the wine feels in your mouth. So uh, you can definitely appreciate wine without having uh, a key sense of smell or let's say the tools to describe wines. I always think it's interesting uh, how people describe wines. You know, I may say this wine is cherries and you may say it's raspberries or whatever. When I'm, for example, in China and I'm speaking to Chinese or other, or other Asian countries about wines, the nomenclature, the lexicon of wines can be very different there because we're describing, uh, we're describing fruits and things that people in other countries or cultures may not even know what we're talking about. So there's a really good example where maybe they, they're not used to eating raspberries so they wouldn't understand what that means, but we can still share common language or um, enthusiasm for wine. So the bottom line is don't get too worried about that, but just think about the overall um, pleasure and enjoyment of the wine and maybe think a little bit more about the textures, the freshness, um, how the wine tastes. Are you really enjoying it? Even if you used your own enjoyment scale and you just go, you know what, from one to five, I really enjoy this by one. That's the lowest and five the most. And just go from there. Great. Uh, Martin asks, what experts or other sources do you trust when buying wine for yourself? Uh, I rely oftentimes on good wine merchants. Or if I'm at a restaurant, I'll talk to a psalm or the owner. I taste a lot of wines, but I can't taste all the wines in the world. 
So I think it's always great to, you know, if you pop into your wine shop or you're in a restaurant and you uh, talk to uh, people who appear to have knowledge and you try a few things and, and if, if it works out, then you start relying on them. That's how I started. I also, when I was young and just getting into wine, I, I used my dad a lot because he was a, a, or still is, he's a wine collector, although he drank most of his collection now. But uh, anyways, in the old days when he had a collection, uh, we used to talk a lot about wine. And I think peer-to-peer uh, conversations about wine and sharing, that's part of the joy of wine. Um, I'm less convinced about some of these, let's say, um, communities or apps where you have millions of people and they're rating um, wines. I think that it's interesting, but I just I don't know how um, accurate it can be for particular people's palates. So I think there's a general trend too in social media like that, where people are, are more interested in, in influencers and people that they can associate with, rather than just massive influencers that you don't really know um, what the motivations are. So um, I just think that it's pretty basic. It's been like that for years that wine is a is something that uh, we all like to share in. and And you need to talk to people that have some knowledge. And so stick with a good wine merchant restaurant people or of course friends that um, have knowledge of wine and then just learn it on your own. Thanks. Uh, Nordica asks, so in addition to merchants and restaurants, are there online retailers that you trust or would recommend as an initial direction so I know where to look? Well, uh, I'm based mostly in Hong Kong or just traveling and tasting wines around the world. So I don't really buy that wine, that much wine online here in, I assume we're in the United States. Um, I do have some wine merchants that I prefer, but that's generally based on particular wines that I like. I mean, just to give you an example, um, I really like drinking Beaujolais because it's an amazing area. I like going there. There are really old vines in France uh, and the wines are incredibly reasonably priced particularly uh, some of the crew Beaujolais, like um, Moulin Avant, Morgan. And one of the best retailers is Kermit Lynch in, uh, in Berkeley. And so if I'm, I have a small house in Napa, if I go up there, I always pick up some Beaujolais, or like I'll call down there or order online. So I think that uh, uh, if you have a wine merchant you like, uh, most of the people are online, you can use that. Sometimes I use Wine Searcher when I'm looking for a particular wine and you can, um, you can just go online, look at it and they'll recommend retailers near you and that can be helpful as, as well. I don't think there's one go-to uh, wine merchant that's you know, the, you know, the perfect place. I think it's, all, but it's, it's useful to buy wines online, obviously. Thank you. Uh, Greg is wondering, for a novice, how can one determine a wine's quality before tasting it? Are there any objective factors or characteristics Well, um, I read this question a few times and I was trying to figure it, figure it out. And I think what you're asking, obviously, um, as we spoke before, you can use other sources such as wine merchants or friends. I think you're looking, oh, uh, maybe something like if you looked at the, for example, alcohol level of a wine, if it's above 15 degrees, then it's not going to be good. Or if you saw a nomenclature on the label that said Grand Reserva, then that means it's really going to be great or Reserva. But unfortunately, I don't think it's as simple as that. I, I wish it was. But uh, I think that there's really, well, and even, dare I say it, some, you know, it, let's say it had a beautiful label or if it was expensive. That's probably most people use price or a lot of people use price for quality which I think there actually is some relation that generally speaking, if wines were more expensive, they would be better quality. Of course, you know, nowadays wines can be so expensive that that's not necessarily the case. But I think that um, the answer is really no, I'm, except for some general concepts like that. And you really have to find quality, you have to talk to people or, or, or use other or resources to figure out the quality of the wine. And of course it's important because wines can be expensive. But remember that in this day and age, you know, you can drink great wine that doesn't have to cost a lot of money. I was just in Chile uh, 
until two days ago. It was there for a week, and there was all sorts of wines that you pay between 12 and $20 a bottle that taste like $40 bottles. So in this day and age, one of the most exciting things is that there's so much great wine out there that doesn't cost a fortune. And it's never been a better time to drink wine than today. I can tell you because I've been drinking it for a long time. Uh, Randall is wondering, how can you objectively taste so many wines in a day and still discern out individual flavors? I think that generally I can speak, I can taste between 50 to 100 wines a day. And... Uh, of course, I take breaks. I um, drink wa a lot of water. In red wines, I might eat uh, black olives, and that resets your palate with tannins. Also, I taste with uh, other editors, whether that's my son, who's 24 and really an awesome taster, or some of the other editors. And so it's really a question of just staying fresh in your mind and then at the same time concentrating. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like asking, you know, how can um, Federer play um, five sets and play incredible tennis the whole time. It's all concentration and practice. Christopher asks, can you share your thoughts on legs and their importance to wine? So um, that's a, a fun question because I, I, uh, I was surprised to see that some people are still talking about legs because when I think of the whole concept of holding up your glass and looking at legs, that it would be just men dressed in um, suits in a, in a gentleman's club in London and discussing legs and smoking cigars. It just seems like an old sort of concept for wine. I think technically it's about glycerin and alcohol in a wine, but I don't really uh, give much importance to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone normally talks about legs. I think it's an old concept that doesn't really say anything about the quality of a wine. If anything, it, it might even be negative with some wines being so alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chris asks, can you elaborate on aerating wine in mouth versus swishing? Is it a matter of preference or do each serve a different purpose? Oh, that's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about it. But uh, so aerating in the mouth is exactly that. It's putting air into the wine, so the nuances come out also when you're smelling and tasting. And swishing is, pro is the same process, but I don't really swish, swish it much like a uh, mouthwash. I notice my son does, which I think is sort of weird, but anyways, <laughs> it seems to work for him. And, uh, but the, the aerating in the mouth is definitely to break up some of the compounds so you can uh, nuance the subtleties and components in the wine. But I can taste wines without doing that as well. So you don't have to you know, accentuate that at, at dinner with lots of people looking at you strangely. Uh, Ryan is wondering, when should you use a decanter or an aerator with wine? So I assume that, well, that's not true. You can use decanters or, decanter, decanters and aerators are different because, well, it, uh, traditionally a decanter is in an old wine to take uh, the wine away from the sediment. And the sediment are the little uh, solid bits that are at the bottom of a bottle after the, uh, as the wines age that drops out. That's normally tannins and sometimes some tartaric acid. But in general, that's what it's always been for for centuries. But at the same time, decanting aerates the wine. And this is important, particularly with younger wines. Sometimes if I have an, uh, a new wine, even a white wine, and it seems closed, it's not giving you a lot, like you think, well, it's a bit flat, or sometimes I'll decant even a white wine, and that gives it air. And an aerator is the same thing, although generally I don't use aerators because I'm, I'm worried that they're too um, abrupt and so I don't use them. I'm not against them, but I don't really have real experience with them. Also, I think that an important thing to consider is your glass. And so glasses aerate wines, particularly some of these extreme shapes, like stuff like Zalto, or um, that's the best example. And it's interesting how, when I started tasting wine seriously in the early 80s, how glasses have grown, like sizes, shapes, and those all aerate and change 
the characteristic of the wine. My glass that I use for tasting is a glass I designed with the French um, company Lalique, and um, I travel with it around the world. They're at, actually I have, they're here today for the for the event, and they tend to be very neutral. They uh, open the wine just enough. They don't really change the character of the wine. And as a critic, it's important to that to me so that the wine that I'm tasting is what I believe is the wine in the bottle. Just think about it for a minute. If you had a glass that really changed the character of the wine, then it's hard to uh, tell people what the wine's really like. Mm -hmm. So just to recap on that, uh, decanters, get yourself a good decanter. It's always useful to decant uh, young wines right before you serve them if you think that it's a little bit sort of reserved or not giving a lot, both white or red. And then on old wines, it's generally good to decant them to get the sediment away. Although some wines, traditionally things like Burgundy that have very, or Pinot Noir that have very fine tannins, some people do not like to decant. So it's something, I know a guy who um, actually writes down all the decanting times for his wine, which seems really rather extreme. So he can just, he used to say to me, um, wh how, would you, how long would you decant the 1983 Pichon de Lalonde? And I said, I don't know, two hours? He goes, no, no, I found an hour and 45 minutes is perfect. And I was sort of freaked out that he was so precise. <laughs> yes. uh, you touched upon glasses a bit in your last mm -hmm. answer, but Joe is wondering, what kind of wine glasses would you recommend for a starter? Are there benefits to these different shapes, or is it worth investing in a more expensive glass? Or I think you can find really good glasses at a reasonable price. Uh, I must say that my glasses are not a reasonable price because they're Lalique and they're crystal, so they're really expensive. That's why, and also they, um, if you break them, you're, gonna, you're not going to be happy. So, but you can find, I think, um, Riedels are good. Um, you can find, I think if you spend, you know, uh, seven, ten dollars a glass, and there's so many good glasses out there, I don't really, I can't tell you if, um, you know, which ones are best, but there's a lot of good glasses. So definitely get yourself some decent glasses because I think, it pays off. Thanks. Martin is wondering, have you found any tools on the market that preserve the integrity of a wine after opening it? Uh, of course, uh, for me, I think the best tool right now for um, after you open a bottle or, or actually not open, but if you want to have a glass and then keep the wine for a while is Coravan. Mm -hmm. And we use Coravan in my tastings. All the wines, just about all the wines we taste, we Coravan. And that it basically has a needle that goes through the uh, cork, and then you can extract a glass of wine from it. And then the amount of space the uh, wine has taken is put in with an inert gas. And this is really great. And all, what's cool is you can then put the wine away in your cellar or lay it down, and it can last a couple years. Wow. So it's really useful. I also use it at, uh, at my wine bar in Hong Kong, and uh, we serve 300 wines by the glass, and it works really, really well. A lot of restaurants use it. It's a bit tricky to use, I must admit, so it takes some practice, because I've heard the canisters are like $20 each, and if you don't do it right, you can go through a canister with just 10 glasses, but we get 130 glasses from it, so it takes some practice. But Coravan, I found the best. I know there's other systems, but that's the one I use. Um, Pratap asks, with the descriptors of wines being subjective, how do you define a standard or benchmark to define a good wine objectively? Or is it meant to be subjective? So rating wines or quality is always um, subjective. So I think that what's interesting with wines, generally speaking, if you have a group of people in a room, everyone agrees on what's what's excellent wine and what's the, the least good wines. And then it's very gray in between. So I think it's all subjective. And of course you can, I know what you're saying by using subjective terms, but those are only descriptors. They're not necessarily, you know, black and white on quality. When do you believe, when you do believe there's a benefit to aging longer, how do you determine how much time is required? So when I'm rating wines or deciding how, how long to age a wine, 
this is normally with reds, but also with whites, particularly things like uh, white burgundy or German Riesling, wines that have a history for aging. Uh, you look at some common things on how the wine is constructed. So talking about red wines, you're looking at the balance between alcohol, fruit, and tannins, as well as acidity. And uh, with white wines, it's mostly fruit and acidity, in some cases, sweetness. If you're talking about fine sweet wines like Sautern or late harvest wines from Germany or Austria. So I think there's accepted standards for all that. And then through experience, you can say, oh, I think this will be better in uh, three or four years because maybe it's a little bit uh, it, it's a little bit out of balance at the moment and you want it all to come together. As the wine ages, all these, con all these components in the wine come together in the bottle. So it's really based on experience. It's not something, it's not like a, uh, there's no formula. I wish there was, but it's through experience. And you have to, just looking at tasting old wines and then remembering what they tasted like when they were young, that's one advantage I have uh, being old now compared to young tasters because they don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you what the 1982 Lynch Bosch tasted like in 1985 because that's when I started tasting wines professionally. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you what it tastes like today. And then I can extrapolate what it was like then and what it's like now. So that's the upper hand I have is all those all those years of knowledge and tasting and, and drinking. Uh, Bob is wondering, with climate being such a vital component in raising grapes, how do you see climate change affecting the wine industry? Yeah, climate change is a is a big problem for all of us, despite some people saying there's no issue. And it's something, of course, we uh, I worry about and I know my son worries about it my daughter because it's a huge issue particularly for their generation and it's really changing the way uh, wine is being produced in the sense it's changing the way uh, grapes are being grown and there's all sorts of issues such as shortage of water sun sun burning I just read something crazy about that the insect po population on the BBC will be decimated in 10 years. I mean, if there's no insects, there's going to be no agriculture. So uh, it's a huge itch issue, and people, uh, wine producers and vine growers, are adapting to that through different um, ways of viticulture, irrigation, um, all sorts of other things, or organic um, growing methods, biodynamic. I think it's something that the industry is well aware of, and actively pursuing and you can see the extremes it seems that so many years are so extreme now you have lots of heat then cold and water it, sometimes it's just biblical what's going on and so um, it's a huge issue that I think all of us are worried about in our lives and wine makers are worried about it as well but so far they've been able to adapt there's a we may have to consider using different grape types than were once uh, used in particular areas, or there'll be new areas that we never thought about growing wine. I don't, I don't think in my lifetime it'll be extreme that we're growing, um, making excellent wines in Denmark, but, um, but even it's interesting that already there's things that I've noticed, like in Alsace, which is traditionally known for making wonderful white wines, now they're making great Pinot Noir because the average grow temperature during the growing season has increased by one degree centigrade, and that's enough to enable them to grow Pinot Noir. Or look at now in so southern England, they're making very good sparkling wines. So things are changing and people are adapting, but you know it's all worrying. And for our final question, a fun one, um, John asks, if you're stranded on an island with a corkscrew and a wine glass, what bottle of red and what bottle of white would you want to have? Yeah, um, I've been asked this question a number of times, and it changes, you know, daily. A lot of times it's sort of, well, the last really good bottle I had, that would be great. I mean, there's such a huge choice out there, but I guess in the end, I would probably, the red wine, I'm sort of classic, 
the red wine would be something like a, a great Barolo from Italy. Um, and then white wine would probably be a white Burgundy. So, but again, there's so many wonderful wines and that's a tough question, but um, those would, I could tell you specific wines, but I, I don't think I'll do that. Um, James, if you're open to it, we've had questions come in throughout. So if you have the time, I'd love to ask two or three. Mm -hmm. Great. Sure. Um, so coming in as live questions. So Jack says, James, thank you so much for doing this masterclass. I've absolutely loved it. What are some other resources, I'm thinking podcasts or books, beyond the masterclass that you'd recommend for a beginner? Well, um, well thanks for taking my class. And I'm glad you've enjoyed it. And um, there were some classic books that I use, like Jancis Robinson's Encyclopedia or Hugh Johnson's book. Um, but I honestly I haven't read like uh, general resource books for a while. And I t um, nowadays it's so easy just to uh, Google stuff. The problem is that a lot of times you're not sure if the source is right. But um, again, I think rather than really study it or you can study some facts um there's good things like wsct uh out of the uk which has courses and you can get a diploma or one day even a master of wine i i, I did all that in the 80s when i lived in london but um the best thing really is to taste wine and just spend once you like a wine then find out more about it check out the the winery's website, talk to other people about it. And it's a it's a, a process all the time. I'm still always learning about wine. That's why it's so much fun. Uh, Teddy is wondering, do you have any tips for a novice like me on how to approach a restaurant's wine list? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I find it always challenging, restaurant wine lists, but I sort of, I, I enjoy, enjoy the challenge because I'm always looking for let's say a good value and a good value can't it's not necessarily the least expensive wine generally it's the wine on the uh, on the first or the bottom third of the list in pricing so uh it could be anywhere from like 30 to it depends on the restaurant to like a hundred dollars but looking for really um something that you know that looks familiar and you might be excited about but also an, an important thing is if you're in a restaurant and they have a good um, wine director, director or psalm, or just ask, say, well, do you have someone who put together the list because I'd like to talk to them about a recommendation? Don't be afraid to go to the restaurant. Uh, I think that places with good wine lists, they have people that can, uh, that can steer you in the right direction. But also just don't blindly take what they say you should drink. I know at our restaurant, our team, always ask what sort of wine do you like to drink uh, what do you normally drink what it's all about you as the uh, customer to have the best experience so just don't blindly take advice but actually give some guidance to have a great wine experience thank you uh, and that is our final question for today so great I wanted to thank you so much for your time and if there's any closing no so uh, it was great to to uh, to talk about wine, I always enjoy talking about wine, and uh, thanks for submitting the questions, and also thanks for all of you out there that have uh, taken the course. Uh, that was really, you know, part of my life. The idea was basically, if you came to my place in Tuscany and hung out with me for a few days, that would be your master class, and I think we succeeded, and particularly with the high production value and. So far, everyone who's taken the course has uh, really enjoyed it, and I'm really excited about that. So if you haven't taken the course, check it out. I think um, it'll be fun, and, and you'll learn a lot, and it'll empower you to really feel enthusiastic about wine and, and not lost, or at least a starting point to learn more about wine and understand how much fun it is. Because you know I've spent my whole life, I'm 60 now, and uh, wine is really part of my life and it's really enhanced it and it's so much fun to drink great wine and share it with your friends and family it's a blast so um, thanks again check out my website when you have the chance there's some good stuff there as well and um, look forward to speaking to you all again